How many alien civilizations do you think are out there? I don't have intuition for that, um, which I, I have always thought was deeply intriguing. So, and, and part of this, uh, I mean, I say it specifically as I don't have intuition for that because it's like one of those questions that you feel around for a while and you really just, you, you, you can't see it, um, even though it might be right there. And, um, in that sense, it's a little like the quantum to classical transition. You're like really talking about two different kinds of physics. And I, I think that's kind of part of the problem. Once we understand the physics, that question might become more meaningful. Hmm. Um, but there's also this other issue. Um, uh, and this was really instilled on me by my mentor, Paul Davies, when I was a postdoc, because he always talks about how, you know, whether aliens are common or rare is kind of just, um, you know, it's it like, you know, it follows a wave of popularity and it just depends on like the mood of, you know, what the culture is at the time. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was kind of an intriguing observation, but, but also there's this, you know, set of points about if you go by the observational evidence, which we're supposed to do as scientists, right? Um, uh, you know, we have evidence of us um, and one original life event from which we emerged. And people want to make arguments that because that event was rapid, um, or because there's other planets that have properties similar to ours, that that event should be common. But you actually can't reason on that because our existence observing that event is contingent on that event happening, which means it could have been completely improbable or very common. Um, and Brandon Carter like clearly articulated that in terms of anthropic arguments um, a few decades ago. So, so there is this kind of issue that we have to contend with dealing with life that's closer to home than we have to deal with with any other problems in physics, which we're we're talking about the physics of ourselves. And when you're asking about the origin of life event, that event happening in the universe, at least is like our existence is contingent on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you can think about sort of fine tuning arguments um, that way too. So, um, but the, the, the sort of odder part of it is like when I think about uh, how likely it is, I think it's because we don't understand this mechanism yet about how information can be generated spontaneously. Mm -hmm. That I like, because I can't see that physics clearly yet, even though I have a lot of, you know, like some uh, things around the space of it in my mind, I can't articulate how likely that process is. Um, so my honest answer is, I don't know. And it, it, sometimes that feels like a cop out, but I feel like that's a more honest answer and a more meaningful way of making progress than um, what a lot of people want to do, which is say, oh, well, we have a one in 10 chance of having it on an exoplanet with Earth-like properties because right. there's lots of Earth-like planets out there and life happened fast on Earth. Well, so <laughs> now kind of a follow-up question, but as a side comment, what I really am enjoying about the way you're talking about human beings is you always say, and not to make yourself conscious about it, because I really, really enjoy it. You say we. Yes. You don't say humans. You say, because oftentimes, like, and, and, you know, I don't know, evolutionary biologists will kind of put yourself out yes. as an observer, but you're, it's, it, it's kind of fascinating to think that you as a human are struggling about your own origins. Yes, that's that's the problem, and yeah, and I I think um, I don't do that deliberately, but I do think that way, and this is sort of the inversion from the logic of physics because physics, as it's always been constructed, has treated us as external observers of the universe, and we are not part of the universe, and this is why the problem of life I think demands completely new thinking because we have to think about ourselves as minds that exist in the universe and are at this particular moment in history and looking out at the things around us and trying to understand what we are inside the system, not outside the system. We don't have descriptions at a fundamental level that describe us as inside the system. And this was my problem with cellular automata also. You're always an external observer yeah. for a cellular automata. You're not in the system. What does a cellular automata look like from the inside? I think you just broke my brain with that question. Exactly, but that's <laughs> I the thought about that for a long time. But. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, yeah, that's a that's a really clean formulation uh, of a very fundamental question because you can only to understand cellular autonomy, you have to be inside of it. But as a human, sort of a poetic, romantic question: Does it make you sad? Does it make you hopeful? whether we're alone or not, like in the different possible versions of that, if we're the highest assembly object in the entire universe, does that- At this you, moment in time, maybe. At this moment in the causal- Because we may, I assume chain. we have a future. Well, we definitely have a future. The question is where, yeah. <laughs> where that future decreases the assembly. Like it could be we're at the peak or we could be just, um, that would be inconsistent with the physics in my mind, but 
So, so I, I should give a caveat. I've given the the caveat that I'm biased as a physicist, but I'm also biased as an eternal optimist. So, pretty much all of my modes of operation for building theories about the world are not like an Occam's razor. What's the simplest explanation? But what's the most optimistic explanation? Um, uh, and part of the reason for that is if you really think explanations have causal power. Um, in the sense that our the like the fact that we have theories about the world has enabled technologies and physically transformed the world around us. I think I have to take seriously that as a part of the physics I want to describe and try to build theories of reality that are optimistic about what's coming next because the theories are in part the causes of what comes next. <laughs> so there could be a physics of uh, hope or a physics of optimism in there too. Yes. Is... Um... That seems like also, I mean, optimism does seem to be a kind of engine that results in innovation. Yes. So this is dry, like, what? why the hell are we trying to come up with new stuff? Oh, so, um, so I made this point about thinking life is the physics of existence. And it's not just the physics of existence, it's the physics of more things existing. <laughs> so I think one of these drives- Creativity. Of like, the, yeah, creativity, like optimism, the, so, so, if you like, if people like entropy. I don't. I don't like entropy as it was formulated in the eighteen hundreds. I think it's an antiquated concept. But, um, but this idea of maximizing over the possible number of states that could exist. Imagine the universe is actually trying to maximize over the number of things that could physically exist. What would be the best way to do that? The best way to do that would be evolve intelligent technological things that could explore that space. 